Would you open your Bibles this morning to Isaiah chapter 42? Isaiah chapter 42, it's on page 717 if you're using a pew Bible. Isaiah chapter 42, page 717. You know, every pastor who's been in ministry could make a list entitled, The Stuff They Didn't Teach Me in Seminary. Well, this morning I have a new item to add to my list, and it's, What Do You Say in Your Last Sermon? What, what are you supposed to preach, especially after 18 and a half years of preaching not just to a church, but a church that has become your beloved family, a church that, is, that, that echoes with that song we just sang, partners in the gospel. What, what do you say after all that time? What, what, what am I supposed to say in, in a brief 35, probably 45-minute sermon? <laughs> and so I decided this morning to take this opportunity to have one last chance to proclaim and to hold up before you the glory of Jesus Christ and His gospel. To have one last chance to lead you in savoring and treasuring the good news of the gospel together. As we end our formal relationship today as pastor and church, let's do it with the gospel ringing in our ears and reverberating in our hearts. So I want to look with you at Isaiah chapter 42, a passage that so beautifully announces the gospel 700 years before the coming of Christ, and yet it's so clear here, it's so clear and powerful. And I just want to savor it with you. I want to treasure Christ with you one last time in the text. And so let me read Isaiah 42. I'm going to read verses 1 to 13. Isaiah 42 says, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law the islands will put their hope. This is what God the Lord says, he who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. See? The former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Sing to the Lord a new song, His praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and all who live in them, let the desert and its towns raise their voices. Let the settlements where Kedar lives rejoice. Let the people of Silah sing for joy. Let them shout from the mountaintops. Let them give glory to the Lord and proclaim His praise in the islands. The Lord will march out like a mighty man, like a warrior. He will stir up His zeal. With a shout, He will raise the battle cry and will triumph over His enemies. Isaiah chapter 42 is one of what scholars call the four servant songs. The four servant songs in the book of Isaiah. You you see there in verse 1, he says, here is my servant. There are these songs in Isaiah that speak of the coming servant of the Lord. 
And this passage falls into three uh, clear sections. Section 1 through 4 is the presentation of the servant. Here's the servant. Verses 5 through 9 is the commissioning of the servant where God speaks to a servant and gives him his orders. And then finally, verses 10 to 13 is the response to the servant. It's, it's how we should respond and react to the coming of this servant. And so again, as I said, what I'd like to do this morning in the, the few moments we have left is I just want to walk you through this passage and just point you to Jesus in this passage. I, I want to show you the gospel in this text. I, I, I want to be like a, like a tour guide in an art museum who, who just takes you in front of a great masterpiece. And if, you, if you've ever been on a tour in an art museum and, and the, the tour guide starts pointing out, now look at this and look at that, and, and suddenly you find yourself just absorbed in the masterpiece. And, and I want us one more time together where I could be the tour guide one more time and, and show you so that you might, by God's grace and through His Spirit, be absorbed in the gospel again, that it might stir your hearts and affect you one last time. And so let's look at this passage. Section 1, verses 1 through 4, the presentation of the servant. Look at verse 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he'll bring justice to the nations. So who is this servant? Well, before you answer, it's actually a little more complicated than it sounds. Because the, the word servant occurs a lot of times in Isaiah, and it seems to refer to different characters. Sometimes in Isaiah, the servant refers to the Old Testament people of Israel, especially in their brokenness and their sinfulness. I mean, look back in your Bibles at chapter 41. 41 verse 8. Here's the servant, but it's clearly the people of Israel. Verse 8, he says, But you, O Israel, chapter 41, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from the farthest corners I called you. I said, You are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. Or look back at chapter 42, verse 18. Here's the servant again, but it's, it's sinful, broken Israel. He says, hear you deaf, look you blind and see, who is blind but my servant, and deaf like the messenger I send, who is blind like the one committed to me, blind like the servant of the Lord. So sometimes the servant is clearly Israel, dismayed and broken and blind and sinful, but other times, the servant is a hero who comes to save Israel and save the whole world. Uh, l- let me show you. Look at Isaiah 49. Turn over. This is another one of the servant songs. Isaiah 49, and I won't read the whole thing. Just look at verse 6. This is the Savior servant. 49, verse 6. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles. Sounds like chapter 42, doesn't it? That you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. So sometimes the servant is broken, wayward, lost, hopeless Israel. And sometimes the servant is one who comes to save and rescue God's people. And not just God's people, but all of the nations. Because Israel was God's servant, but it was a failed servant. In fact, if if you kind of pull the camera lens back from just Israel in the Old Testament, and you look at all of the figures of the Old Testament, you see that the Old Testament is a story of servants of the Lord who totally blew it. You know, who's the first servant of the Lord in the Bible? Adam. He's the servant. Hey, take care of the garden. Protect it. Watch over it. Don't let evil come in. But evil came in, and and Adam didn't guard the garden and defeat the serpent. Instead, he surrendered himself to the lies of Satan, and so he plunged our world in darkness. And and so it is with every one of the great heroes of the Bible. There's drunken Noah. There's lying, fearful Abraham. You know, there's rebellious Moses, angry Moses. There's adulterous David. And then there's idolatrous Israel. 
And so the story of the Bible is of all of these failed servants. And of course, that's why when we open the pages of the Bible, even though it's this old ancient book, it speaks to our hearts in such a contemporary fashion. We find ourselves reflected in the pages of Scripture. I'm reading about a, a, a Bedouin from 2000 BC, and I'm looking at a story and going like, oh my, that's me. <laughs> I'm like that too. Because it's the story of all humanity. We were all called to be the servants of God. What, why, you know, why are human beings here on this earth? What's the, the purpose of human life? And the Bible is very clear on that. The purpose of human life is that every one of us is called to be the servant of God. We're called to love Him, to obey Him, to know Him, to treasure Him, and to do His will. Every one of us is called to be a servant of God, and every one of us should be fired. (laughs) We have blown it big time in all kinds of ways, subtle ways, big ways. And so God has chosen to raise up another servant, the servant par excellence who would do his will, the servant upon whom he would set his spirit, and this servant would get it right. He would always do the will of God. And so he would put his spirit on him, chapter 42, verse 1, the delight, the one in whom God delights. And our minds drift back to 2,000 years ago when, when Jesus came down the banks of the Jordan River to be baptized by John. You know that story? And he went into the, down into the river with John and he, he went under the water and he came up. And then what happened? The Spirit came down on him. And the voice said from heaven, this is my beloved Son whom I love. And, and so we were shown right there, this is the servant that we've been waiting for, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the mission of this servant? What is it that he is supposed to do? What's the job description that the Lord gives to his servant? Well, look back at chapter 42, verse 1. It says, I'll put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Again, in verse 3, in faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. Again, in verse 4, He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. And in his law, the islands will put their hope. So he's coming to bring justice. Now, when we hear the word justice in English, we we tend to think of, I tend to think of, justice is the bad guys getting punished. You know, justice is when people who break the law get arrested and accused and thrown in jail. Bad guys are punished. That's justice. You know, my, my view of justice was shaped by like Batman and Superman growing up. And, you know, they formed the Justice League, right? And what's the main job of the Justice League? Capture the villains and put them in jail. You know, justice, Lex Luthor behind bars. Yes, right? But the biblical concept of justice is broader. It includes the bad people getting their punishment. But the, the biblical concept of justice is that of a, a society, a world where where what is right reigns and, and where everything is well-ordered the way God designed it to be, where, where everything is under God's law and God's kingdom, and so that there's, there's actually joy and prosperity and blessing in God's world. It's, it's a more comprehensive concept. Uh, you, you know, the first just society was the Garden of Eden before Adam went awry and Eve went awry. There was a picture of the just society. Israel was supposed to be a society of justice with God's law. And, and so we, we long for that. Every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying for the coming of justice, that the world would function and operate the way God originally designed it to be in families, in communities, Because here's the thing, everybody, almost everybody it seems, recognizes that something is seriously wrong with the world. And and this this goes beyond Christianity. I mean, pretty much every world religion affirms in some way or another that something is broken with the world. Most political philosophies, most activists out there, they're activized because they see something is wrong with the world. 
Most views uh, are, are sort of motivated by something is wrong and we need to fix it. And, and that something that's wrong is, is just so obvious. I mean, it could be on the, you could look at the news, the headline news, all the big things happening in the world, whether it's terrorism or genocide or war or famine or injustice or human trafficking or, or the, great, the, the great evil of our age, abortion. All the ways that there's just evil in the world that has, has ruined nations and peoples. But it's not just on the headline news. I mean, we don't have to look that far, right? We just need to go to school with the other kids. We just need to go to work on Monday. We just need to talk to the other people in the neighborhood or, or whatever. Uh, and, and there we experience the brokenness and the dysfunction of our world. Uh, we don't have to look to the headline news to experience betrayal and lies and selfishness and agendas and abuse and neglect We wring our hands over ISIS, but I think that dysfunctional families have had a far more damaging impact on all of us than anything ISIS has done because we live in a sinful and broken world. And so this servant is coming to fix that, to bring the justice and the order of God back to God's universe. It's huge. And then here's the, the other thing that's so remarkable is how he plans to do it. This is, this is sort of the, the mode in which he's going to operate, that he's going to bring justice to the world through gentleness and meekness. I mean, verses 3 and 4 are just amazing. Verses 2 and 3, rather. He says, he will not shout or cry out. He won't raise his voice in the street. You know, when this guy comes, it's not going to be like a presidential stump speech or a debate. It's not going to be demagoguing and, and posturing and yelling and blogging and, and making statements. It's, he's not going to raise his voice in the streets. If you don't pay attention, you might miss him, in fact. And I love verse 3. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. When he brings God's new order He's going to do it in such a gentle way that even, you know, a bruised reed, I was thinking like a, a tree limb, you know, that's broken, like a little twig, and it's, it's broken in half, but it hasn't fallen off. It's just connected by a little bit of bark and a little bit of wood, you know, wood tissue in there. It's just kind of hanging, and all it would take is just grab that thing and snap it, and it would come off. But this servant, he's so gentle, he wouldn't break that. That even though the candle just has a little tiny red ember at the tip of the wick, he, he's not going to come along and be like, eh, whatever, you know, start over. It's, he, he, he's going to take care of smoldering wicks and, and bruised reeds. This is a gentle Savior. That when God sends his servant, the servant's not going to come with a big wrecking ball or a bulldozer like we deserve and say, ah, forget this, we're starting over. You know? He comes to the broken and to the needy and to those who are weak. He's a gentle Savior. As we think of the Lord Jesus Christ and His ministry, was that not how our Savior came? Humbly, gently, tenderness to bring justice. In fact, put a bookmark here in Isaiah 42. I'm going to come right back to it. I'd like you to turn over to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. It's on page 967 in your pew Bible, 967. So in Matthew chapter 12, just to set the stage, it's Jesus. And he's being harassed by the Pharisees. He heals a guy on the Sabbath. I mean, God forbid (laughs) he would heal a guy on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees are like, you can't do that. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, and healing's like work, so stop it. And he's like, you guys, you're out to lunch. I mean, that's my version. (laughs) So verse 14, chapter 12, the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. So what does Jesus do? Aware of this, verse 15, Jesus withdrew. He's gentle, he's meek. He withdrew from that place. Many followed him, and he healed their sick. He's healing all the broken reeds and the smoldering wicks, and he warned them not to tell who he was. He's not announcing himself in the street. 
And this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I've chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I'll put my spirit on him. He'll proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out, nor will uh, hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out until he leads justice to victory. And in his name the nations will put their hope. If you're here this morning and you feel like a bruised reed or a smoldering wick, Jesus is the Savior for you. If you come here this morning and and you feel broken because of your sin or broken because of your circumstances, you feel like you're just hanging on, there's all this joy and excitement here this morning and we're all singing and there's this kind of festive atmosphere at South Shore Baptist, but inside... You, you, you are wounded and tired and discouraged and hopeless. I want you to know that the Savior God has sent will not break a bruised reed. He will not snuff out a smoldering wick. This is Jesus who said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So we proclaim a Savior, and we we try strive to be a church of grace and of gentleness as broken sinners like us come into the presence of the Lord. So then, going back to Isaiah 42, how then will he do this in that first section, verses 1 through 4, the presentation of the servant, I mean, that's, that's a pretty big campaign promise, isn't it? I'm going to fix the world, and I'm going to do it by being gentle. And it's like, oh, Jesus, I mean, you know, th- this is a mess. It, you, it, this world, I mean, people who are gentle and kind in this world get run over. People who are gentle and kind in this world, they get beat up. I mean, you, you, this is a dog-eat-dog world. If you're going to try to do something in this world, you've got to be tough. You know, Jesus, if you come here and try to be all gentle and fix the world, they're going to crucify you. Yeah, I know. That's the plan. Look at verse, verses 5 through 7. Here's the second section now, the commissioning of the servant. Now we go from presenting the servant to God speaking orders. He's, he's giving orders to the servant. He's like, this is what you're going to do. This is what I'm actually going to do through you. Here's the plan. Verse 5, this is what God the Lord says, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk in it. What a great verse describing God the Creator. And he says, I the Lord, verse 6, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand and I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the peoples and a light for the Gentiles to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from darkness uh, dungeon those who sit in darkness. God is going to send this servant. And look what he's going to do. It's, it's really remarkable. See that in verse 6? He's going to make the servant to be a covenant. You see that? Not to make a covenant, not to broker a covenant, to be the covenant. That, that this servant in his own person, in his body, in himself, he is going to be the covenant. A covenant, of course, is, a, is an agreement that binds parties together who are, who are at odds or, or unrelated. You know, marriage is a covenant. You take two people who are completely unrelated, who have no obligations to each other, they enter a covenant, and now it's till death do you part. Right? That's a covenant. And so God is, is saying, I'm going to make you to be the covenant. There's, there's me, God, Verse 5, the creator God. And then there's humanity that's in rebellion against me. And we have a big problem. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you the covenant that brings us back together. You, yourself, are going to be the bridge. You will be the glue. You, my servant, will be what brings heaven and earth back into union through your work that you're going to do. You know, here's a question for you. We all recognize something is seriously wrong with the world, but what at the root is the thing that's wrong with the world? You know, if we were to go over to uh, Derby Street Shops after lunch here and just wander around and interview people, 
I say, yeah, look, what, what do you think is the big problem in the world today? It'd be interesting to see all the answers you'd get. I bet some people would say, well, you know, there's, uh, you know we, we need more uh, education for people. Or some people would say, well, it's, it's really poverty, and if, if people had basic resources around the world, a, a lot of the world's problems would disappear because people would, would finally be stable. Or, or people might say, well, it's, it's just... Uh, you know, strife between people and people distrusting people and people labeling people, that kind of thing. And you know what? Those are all huge problems, and and those things do all need to be attended to. But as we look at Scripture, we see that those problems are ultimately symptomatic. They're not the root problem. Yeah, they're big problems. And, And many of us, God is called to deal with those problems, and that's good. But Jesus came. He had to go deeper. Because if if we could just hand out you know, food and clothing and water and shelter to the whole world, it would be a wonderful thing, but the root would still be the same. You know, we're in a prosperous nation. We have food and clothing and shelter, and we're a really sick country because it's a deep root of sin. The problem with humanity, the thing that has caused us to go awry is ultimately at the very core this rupture between us and our Creator. It's that we are in a slave revolt against the master. And and we have said serving ourselves and doing it our way and being our own gods and trying to create our own utopian versions, that is where life is, and, and God doesn't have it. And so there's this rebellion that we have pushed away from God. That's the root of it all, and out of that comes all of the dysfunction and all of the sin and all of the brokenness in our own hearts. And so this... This servant is going to come and he's going to restore order, not by slaughtering the rebels, but by reconciling the rebels, by, by coming to make a new covenant in his own body. And he did it, of course, by burying our sins on the cross. Look at Isaiah 53, another of the servant songs. This one you might know, Isaiah 53. Look at verse 10. How in the world could a gentle, humble servant bring justice to the world by getting to the root problem of sin and dealing with our estrangement from God? Verse 10, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering on the cross, Jesus was the offering to satisfy God's judgment against our guilt. He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Is the resurrection. He's going to live after he dies. Verse 11, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant, the servant, will justify many and he'll bear their iniquities. Therefore, I'll give him a portion among the great, and he'll divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured his life out unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And so this servant did the impossible. He brought a solution to the core problem of the human story, which is our estrangement from God by being the sin offering. And so now he's, he himself is the covenant. Every time we have communion, we, we think of that cup where Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This bread is the bo- it's my body broken for you in the new covenant. And so in himself is our covenant. Jesus is our covenant with the Father. But not only did he die for our sins, praise God, he rose again. And so we worship a risen Savior and a living Savior, a Savior who not only died to make the covenant, but rose to rescue us. Go back to Isaiah 42. He's not just a covenant, but look at verse 6. A covenant for the people and light for the Gentiles. He came bursting out of the tomb in light and glory, and now He comes to bring light for those who are in darkness Verse 7, to open eyes that are blind and free captives from prison to release from the dungeon. Every Christian, every real Christian can resonate with verse 7. If you're a Christian, you read that and you go, you know what? That's what God did for me. 
He opened my blind eyes and He released me from the prison of my sin. Some of us have experienced that in different ways. Some of us, it was when we were a little kid, like age five. And some of us, when we were 45 and after we had done all kinds of things. But either way, it's the same miracle. It's a light from heaven shining into our hearts so that we come to have faith in Christ. And and we're free. And so the crucified Christ bears our sins and the risen Christ releases us from prison. That's why we, we sing with such gusto that song. Um, mind if I we just sing it again real quick? Take out your hymnal. We'll just sing one line. We'll just sing one line. But look at 347. 347. Amazing love. And can it be. Let's just sing that third stanza again together. And, and as you sing it this time, think about the imagery of this stanza in light of Isaiah chapter 42. And, and just notice how this is the testimony of every true Christian. All right, we'll sing this together. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine high diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed Thee. Amazing love, how can it be that the Amen. That's our story. That's why we rejoice. That's our corporate testimony, though it it comes in different narratives. And if you're here this morning and you're not yet a Christian, if you're here this morning and, and you're just curious or learning and you wonder what is this Christianity thing all about, that's it. It's about a Savior who releases captives from prison because here's the thing you need to know man you are blind just like we all are by nature you are imprisoned you you can't make yourself see if you're blind if you're prison you can't let yourself out god has to do it and god has sent his servant to release the prisoners and to open the eyes of the blind and to give faith to hearts that could never generate faith because they're dead in their sins. This is the great saving work of God. Do you know it? Have you experienced it? And this is what's going on in the world today. This message of Christ is going out and it's opening the eyes and it's opening hearts. But as it goes, it's still very gentle. It's not raising its voice in the streets. If you don't pay attention, you won't see it. People might say, well, you know, Jesus came to bring justice. Looks like the world is just as messed up as ever. Yeah, for now, there's still a lot of messed up in the world, but there's something else happening. There is the kingdom of God, heart by heart, life by life, spreading quietly. And just as if you you might miss Jesus if you weren't paying attention, you will miss his kingdom if you're not paying attention. Because it's moving quietly until the day when Christ returns. And then it'll be real obvious that the justice has finally come to the world. And so that leads to our response to this new work of God that He's done. I love verse 9. See the former things have taken place and new things I declare. The coming of Jesus is this new thing. And look at the response Verse 10, so here's the third section. Section 1, the presentation of the servant. Section 2, the commissioning of the servant. And then finally, section 3 is the response to the servant and his work. And what is it? It's, it's international praise. International praise. Verse 10, sing to the Lord a new song, His praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and all who live in them, 
Let the desert and its towns raise their voices. Let the settlements where Kedar lives rejoice. Let the people of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the mountaintops. Let them give glory to the Lord and proclaim His name in the islands. The Lord will march out like a mighty man. Like a warrior, He will stir up His zeal. With a shout, He will raise the battle cry and triumph over His enemies. Verses 10 to 13 are very noisy verses. They're boisterous and they're loud and they make you want to put your fingers in your ears when you read them. There's just so much noise coming out of these verses. And that's how we respond to this salvation. You know, verse 10, sing to the Lord. Sing His praise. Verse 11, raise their voices. Rejoice. Sing for joy. Shout for the mountaintops. Verse 12, give glory and proclaim Even Yahweh when He comes, when the Lord comes, He he raises a shout of battle. It's very noisy verses. And and this is the proper response to the gospel and to God's salvation that He's brought us. Is is that it should stir in us a reflex of of worship and awe that, that we have been saved and that God is reconciling us to Himself. I mean, isn't that why we get together here every Sunday morning? You know, why do we come? Why do we do this? We get together, get a squish in, you know, and get up early. Like, why, do, why are we doing this as a church? Why are we worshiping? And it's because this great gospel is still blowing us away. And the more we live as Christians, and the more we understand our sin, and the more we see what Christ has done for us, our awe and our wonder at the gospel is just sinking deeper and deeper. And we have this sense that we, we ain't seen nothing yet. That someday we'll stand before God, and, and all the worship we've done up to this point will just be the, the, the beginning hum before the great worship that's coming. When we really see the magnitude of what Christ has done for us. And so we gather in this kind of warm-up. You know, we gather on Sunday mornings, it's kind of like our, our warm-up for heaven. You know, when the guy, before the opera, they're in the back, they're going, me, 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 you know. That's, that's, that's what we're doing here. Every Sunday morning, me, 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 we're getting, our, getting us ready to worship. We're getting ready for eternity where we will be in bodies raised in power and glory, able to worship and delight in God with all of our might. And it begins now as we sing a new song to the Lord. And so we come every Sunday morning, whether we've had a great week or whether we've had a disaster of a week. Because we know that if we've had a great week, we come to sing on Sunday morning and to worship knowing that no matter how good our week was, it's like nothing compared to what Christ has done for us and what's coming. And if we've had a disaster of a week where we're just a smoldering wick, we know that whatever suffering and trials we're experiencing in this life, in our families, with our health, with money, whatever, that those sufferings are, are light and momentary compared to the eternal weight of glory that's coming when Christ returns. And so, and so we, we, we come here because this is like a reality check. The world out there is not real in, in the sense of it, it's not square with what's true. And so we come here to be like, no, no, we need to get recalibrated to reality. The reality is we've been saved from the wrath of God through the sacrifice of Jesus, and eternal life is our home. And all of this life then is lived in light of this great salvation we have received. And when our heads are on right, and we've been recalibrated by the gospel, well, of course we sing. And of course, we praise Him. And of course, we rejoice even when life is just hammering away at us relentlessly. We continue to praise God in the darkness and in, in the flames because we see what's true. The other thing I notice about these verses in this final section is that the praise isn't just us, is it? It's global. It's international in scale. In fact, the global theme has been running throughout this whole section. Have you noticed it? You go back to verse 1. He will bring justice to the nations. Um, Verse 5. Actually, verse 4. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth and in his law the islands 
will put their hope. You know, who are the islands? Some of your Bibles may have a different translation. I might say coastlands. You could translate it islands or coastlands, you know, places by the water. I mean, who are the islands? For, for the people of Israel, the islands are, are another way of saying, like, those people way out, way, 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 way far away. You know, the Israelites were not a seagoing people. So for them, the coastlands and the islands are like, and the people who are so far away, we don't even know who they are, we're never going to meet them. They're just way out in the islands. So it's another way of saying the whole world to the ends of the earth, that they're going to hope, those distant peoples who don't even know are going to hope in the servant. Or look at verse 5. We have this picture of God who spreads out the earth. Again, this global focus. This is not just a limited salvation for a small group of people. There's a global scope to it geographically. Or look at verse 6. Oh, verse 6 is staggering. That, that the servant will be a light for the Gentiles. The, gen, the pagan Gentiles who worship idols. He's going to come and be a light for them. He's going to do what Israel failed to do, which was to be a light to the nations. And then, of course, our passage. Verse 10. His praise is going to go to the ends of the earth. Those who go down to the sea and all that is in it. The islands, again, there's those islands, those coastlands. Verse 11. Let the desert and its towns raise their voices. This is way out in the wilderness to the southeast of Israel. Settlements of Kedar, people of Selah. Verse 12, let them give glory to the Lord and proclaim His praise from the islands. And so, so the picture here is of worship on a global scale. This is not just one little place or one little people because the gospel is for all nations because Jesus is worthy of the worship of all nations. The gospel is not just for us here in, on the South Shore. It's also for Taiwan. It's also for Thailand. It's for Argentina. It's for South Africa. It's for Morocco. It's for Iceland. It's for all the nations of the world. From the North Pole to the South, all around the equator, Jesus is worthy of the worship of all nations, and He is gathering for Himself a global choir that will praise His name forever and rejoice and delight in Him forever. That's the people that he's gathering. And I point that out to you, South Shore Baptist Church, especially as you enter this new season of the unknown and the uncertain, perhaps the scary. And I just encourage you to keep the global call to spread the gospel in your hearts and minds. You know, again, the temptation during an interim period is to withdraw, to conserve energy, to shrink vision, to not dream big, and and to kind of go into a survival kind of mode. But but what I've been trying to really do these last three sermons, maybe you're starting to see the the shape of it now, but these last three sermons, I've just been trying to, to urge you into a certain kind of posture as a church, not to tell you what to do or, or, you know, who, who to hire or what decisions to make, but, but I want to sort of more, more say this is the kind of mindset and posture that, that I would urge upon you as you go into an unknown future. Number one, to be a people who tremble at His Word, to be a people who, who look at the Bible as, as where we're going to find our path forward. And then last Sunday, to be strong and courageous and to make disciples of all nations, to, to not have a have a withdrawn posture, but to, to be leaning in and saying, even in this interim, I need to be reaching out with the gospel to the people God has put in my life, and we need to think about the expanse of the gospel on the South Shore. And so now, this Sunday, I just want to take you the next step and say, look a little higher, look a little farther, and realize that the game is still on, that the gospel still needs to go to all nations and all peoples. Don't lose sight of that. Keep praying for missionaries. Keep, keep tuned in to what God is doing globally. When missionaries come to visit us here, man, take that opportunity and listen to them and, and connect with them. And so whether God is calling you to pray for the global advance of the gospel or give financially to it or maybe even go, I, I pray that some of you would go. 
And certainly that's part of Seth, Pastor Seth's and my story is that we're the latest people God has tapped to go. But all of us need to keep this global perspective and realize that our Jesus is not just someone who helps us through tough times, but that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's worthy of the worship of all peoples and all nations. It was in September of 2015, this last fall, that uh, Jennifer and I returned from Abu Dhabi on a top secret trip. The church here didn't know we had gone. We went to interview, and the church there didn't know we were there, so it was all top secret. Um, and then we came back and got back here mid, mid-September, and the uh, got a message from the, the board there and the search committee there, and they were saying, you know, we feel unanimous that we want you to come as now as our official candidate, you know, officially, publicly being the one that we're considering to be the senior pastor, and, uh, and they said, you know, would you like to accept the candidacy? And, and so, you know, Jennifer and I said, you know, give us a few days. Like, we just need to think. We need to talk a little bit more. We just got back from this trip. We need to f- sort all this out, and they said, fine. So we took a couple days, and we were praying and talking and going for long walks and thinking about all that, that this kind of a move would mean and, you know, the reality of it sitting in. And, like, like we're seriously thinking about moving our family to the Middle East. Like, what, what are we talking about here? I mean, it's just, you know, sorting through all the emotions and leaving people. And, and uh, finally, you know, we'd set a day. We're like, okay, this is the day we're going to make a decision. Because, you know, you can just keep putting a decision like this off forever. So we just kind of set an arbitrary date. We said, right, this day we're going to make a decision and we're going to email them back. So I got up that morning, as I usually do, my little, I don't know if you have a morning ritual. I have a morning ritual, things I do every morning. I go downstairs. I get my Bible to do my Bible reading. I get a big glass of water. I pour some lemon juice in it because I had a kidney stone once. And wow. So... Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I don't want that again, so I, I do my anti-kidney stone uh, home remedy and uh, get my Bible, and I sit down, and I get my iPad out, and it has the, I, use, I do a read through the Bible in a year thing, and so I was like, okay, what's today's reading, da, 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 and I open up my Bible, and guess where I turn? Isaiah 42, and I begin to read verse 9, that the Lord is declaring a new thing. And then I read more about this song that God is calling forth. Verse 10, from the ends of the earth. And then from the islands? And I'm thinking about Abu Dhabi. You know, just go on Google Maps. Look at Abu Dhabi. It's a bunch of islands connected or even if it's coastlands, it fits. And then I saw verse 11. Let the desert and its towns raise their voices. And I'm, I'm thinking of this town in the desert on the islands. And I'm thinking of this church where, where literally the nations are coming through, rotating through. This church where there's 50, 60 different nationalities. And I'm And at this point, my heart is beating, and I'm starting to cry. But then there's a weird thing in verse 11, the settlements of Kedar. I'm like, I don't know what that is. (laughs) Maybe maybe that's my escape clause. (laughs) So I go, and I get my, my Bible study tools. Do you know who the Kedarites are? They're the Arabs. They're the Arab people. So I just said, yes, sir. (laughs) Okay. And so, South Shore Baptist Church, I want you to know this morning that I'm not leaving you because of any lack of love for this congregation. I am leaving you because the love of Christ compels me to go. I want you to know this morning that I'm not leaving because Abu Dhabi is more exciting or more exotic 
or better or more challenging or I'm just up for something new. I want you to know that I'm going because I am a servant of the Lord, small s, and my master and yours has summoned me and redeployed me to proclaim the news of his servant, capital S, to the nations and to a city in the desert on the coast. I want you to know that I am in no way tired of worshiping and singing with you at South Shore Baptist Church, but I'm going because Jesus is worthy of the songs of all the nations. I'm going knowing that there is a great reunion coming in glory where we will all be together, all of us, and we're going to have forever to be together, and the quality of our fellowship in the new heavens and the new earth will far surpass the most precious relationship we've ever known on this earth. Even the most tender marriage and relationship between parents and children will be far outshone by the fellowship and unity that we will experience on that day. And that's my hope. But the problem is we're not ready for that reunion yet. Because not all the invitations have gone out. Not all for whom Christ died have heard the news. Jesus is filling a great global choir for His praise and His glory. And there are still empty seats with names on them. The names for whom Christ died. His elect people. And the way they will be gathered is through the preaching of the gospel. And so I go. And you know what? You go. We all go every day, wherever the Lord sends us. It's nothing magical about Abu Dhabi versus New England. Everyone needs to hear. We all go. Because our Master has said that this gospel of the kingdom must be preached to all nations as a testimony to all peoples. And then, only then, the end will come. Praise God.